All right, we are live, or so-called, so let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. For those who are sick, Father, and there seems to be many, we pray your blessings upon them and give us the wisdom to understand the truth you reveal through your word today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the way we do it, hey Douglas, the way we do it, you know, we're, we, we come in and we pick up on a verse where we left off and sometimes we lose the context. So we're only on just a few verses in, so I'm going to back up and read it so that you get the context of what Paul's saying today. So in Romans chapter 3, so then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? And Paul answers the question, great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. So what advantage is there to being a Jew? You were given the word of God from the beginning. Okay? You have that as your legacy, your heritage, whatever. Something you should take to heart. Now, the problem is they didn't. But he's, he's you know, making the case. Remember, he's, talked about, he's talking about the covenant. And the issue is those who truly believe versus those who just in name only are Jewish. All right? What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? There were Jews who didn't believe. Those who built the golden calf when they came out of Egypt did not believe in God. They did not trust in God, okay? They built a golden calf and worshiped a pagan idol, okay? Happened all through the history of the Old Testament. There were those Jews who were faithful to what God gave them, and there were those who were Jews by ethnicity, but who rejected what God gave them. Ethnicity meaning that they were born into it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Were the Jews basically like the... Troublemakers? Because no. it seems like everybody was against the Jews. Well, everybody was against the Jews. Now, now, Bobby, play that out in your mind. You have God's chosen people yeah. through whom he's going to bring the promise of salvation to the world. Mm -hmm. Who wants them destroyed? Everybody. Motivated by the devil. Yes. Okay? The moment God says, I want you, the devil says, I'm going to get you. Yeah. Okay? So you've got, and plus, the reality, Israel the location of the nation is the crossroads of the world. If you're coming from the east, you go through Israel. Coming from the west, you go through Israel. Going north-south, you go through Israel unless you cross the ocean, the Mediterranean. Okay? Everybody goes through there. Trade routes, everything. So uh, he, who, he who controls the roads controls the money. So conquer the Jews, control the trade routes. Okay? A lot of stuff in there. All right? So if the Jews aren't faithful, does that nullify God's faithfulness? No. That's what Paul said. All right? Uh, and then, may it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. Doesn't matter if nobody believes in God. God is still true. If everybody denies what God has said, what God has said is still true. You know, whether I like it or not, truth is truth, and truth comes from God. And he continues, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Okay? That's where we left off. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The, the God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. That's where we pick up today. So if we're unfaithful and God is faithful, what is he going to do? He's going to be true to himself and he's going to judge those who are unfaithful. And that is Paul's argument at this point. The more we see the unrighteousness of man, the more clearly we see the correctness of God's righteous judgment. Okay? Is it righteous judgment to imprison a murderer? Yes. Yes. Okay? Play that down. Any and every sin is a, is a death penalty, a capital offense against God. Is God just in judging those who sin against him. Yes. Yes. Okay. God is going to be true to himself. Okay. God Is God unjust in punishing evildoers? No. But the unbelieving world thinks so. It's not fair. I don't like it. Is that where they come up with, why well, if God was really good, he wouldn't let this happen? Yeah. That kind of thing. We, we put our perspective or our set of values on God and we want God to fit our mold but God doesn't play that game God is God and you can't put God in a box and control him 
He says, you submit to me. He's God. We're not. But sinful humanity, sinful man, in his arrogance, what? Makes himself out to be God. I'll make up my own rules. I'll do what I want. And everyone should submit to me. Okay? Uh, Naaman. Naaman. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Now, that statement is a harsh statement. We don't like those statements. We want to soften it. We want a, we want a kinder, gentler God. Okay? And we forget when Jesus comes back, he, comes, he doesn't come back as Savior. He comes back as judge. And he is going to execute the wrath of God on everyone who has no faith in him. And hell is a very real place. Okay? But because we've made God a kinder, gentler God, there's no imperative, no, no yearning and desire to save the lost because God's a gentler, kinder kind of God. That's our perspective. So we don't care about the unbeliever if they're an unbeliever because we don't have a sense of urgency because we have denied the judgment of God that's coming. What's your question? Isn't vengeance and wrath the same? That he reserves one for his adversaries and one for his enemies? Well, he's saying the same thing twice. Okay. You, you know, if you're my adversary, you're my enemy. Okay. He's saying the same thing twice for emphasis. Okay. I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does the law, or does not the law also say these things? Does the law say that the sinner deserves judgment? Yeah, all over the place. Okay. Back to, you see, it gets confusing when you parse it out. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? Keep in context. God is just, and we can't say otherwise. Otherwise, how would God judge the world? God judges by his standards, not man's standards. What's God's standard? Perfection, holiness, correctness. Any exceptions? No. No. Okay, so if that was the end of the story, what would happen to every one of us? We'd be lost. We'd be lost, we'd go to hell, we'd suffer the punishment and judgment of God forever. See, God cannot just set aside his judgment. It's not like you say, yes, you deserve judgment, but okay, I'm just going to forget about it and we're going to start over. God can't do that. We want, him, we want him to, but God can't do that. God is holy and he must be faithful to himself or he's not God. So he, he's going to punish sin. His grace moved him to punish sin in himself in the person of his son to execute his judgment in Jesus so his judgment against sin is satisfied and we can have forgiveness that's why there's no salvation apart from Jesus because we're all under judgment Jesus is the only way we escape receiving that judgment ourselves because he took it for us and that's one of the hardest things to understand and we don't really plumb the depths of God's grace like we should. Jesus went to the cross. Let's use Bobby as an example. Okay, I'm going to pick on Bobby. God knew from eternity Bobby was going to be born. God loved Bobby from eternity. And God had determined to send Jesus into the world to pay for Bobby's sins from eternity. But God also knew that no matter what he did, Bobby was never going to believe in Jesus. And Bobby was going to die and go to hell and suffer the judgment of God forever. And yet Jesus came into the world, went to the cross, took Bobby's sins upon himself, suffered the judgment of God, and shed his blood for Bobby, even though God knew Bobby was going to reject him. And it broke God's heart. It broke God's heart. So you're saying, so when God created a him, Bobby, in his mother's womb, God already knew that he was going to reject him. Yeah, God knows well, making. God knows the future as well as because and, and that's one of those the whole mysteries maybe we need to 
ask God when we get to heaven. Because if I truly understand what, what scripture reveals, let's pick one of your kids. The moment, Jessica, let's pick her, or, or, or Tyler, let's pick Tyler, put on the boys' story, Tyler. The moment Tyler was conceived, he gets DNA from mommy and daddy. Correct. That DNA creates what we see. But God created his spirit at that instant and placed Tyler's spirit in the body. That part of him that when he dies, leaves the body and goes to heaven or hell, that part God created because God is still involved in creating every human being. Every single human being is created by God in his image. It's not just he started the procreation and let it go. God's still intimately involved because because Solomon talks about in the last chapter of Ecclesiastes that we'll return to the dust and our spirit will return to God who gave it. When did God give it? When we were conceived, when we were first born. Okay? So God creates because he loves. He loves his children. The fact that his children are disobedient, as Jackie said, breaks his heart. The grace of God says, I'm going to die for you even if you hate me. That's agape love. Agape love says, I'll die for you if you're my enemy. I'll die for you if my friend. No matter what, I will give myself for you because I'm going to love you regardless of what you do. And so, so see, the Calvinists don't like that. Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood only for those God knew who would believe. Jesus did not shed his blood on the cross for those whom God knew wouldn't believe. So he didn't die for the people that go to hell. He only dies for the people that go to heaven. Because God knew beforehand who would believe and who wouldn't. That's what the Calvinists teach. We reject that. Jesus died for everyone because his love, his grace, agape love, selfless love, says, I'll, I'll, I'll give everything for you even if you reject me because my heart is to love you regardless of what you do. That's the motivating factor of God. Why he would create an unbeliever? Yeah. It's, it's free will. He yeah, creates us. We still have a choice. That's, that's what I was about to say. We still have the choice it's our choice to reject God. His choice is to claim us as his own, but, but he won't make us believe. Let's back up. You said he already knew he was going to reject him. He knew. That's his foreknowledge. Okay. But just because God knows something in advance doesn't mean he makes it happen. Oh, no, true. You, yeah. Again, back so he can change you along the way to accept him. Do what? He can change you along the way to accept him? No. He does not force himself on anyone. The Spirit comes offering grace and forgiveness, and your only ability is not to say no. You can't say yes unless he helps. That's the creation of faith. That's grace. But you can say no to what the Spirit does and reject it. That's your choice. So if a person is saved and goes to heaven, God did it completely. If a person dies and goes to hell, they did it to themselves because they said no to God. So that's like somebody sitting on a park bench and some guy comes by and Hey, you little trouble, man. Let me tell you about Christ. And you get up and say, no, that's rejecting the Spirit. Yeah. Because he came with the Spirit. Anytime. You could, you could hear a song on a radio that reveals God's love for you and say, I don't believe it. You could listen in church and hear it preaching. You could have your grandmother tell you. How many times does God come to us and say, I love you and I want you? And every time the Spirit is there to, to yearning, calling to you. And you still have the freedom in human free will to say no. See, before the fall, free will was I can choose to do good, I can choose to do evil. After the fall, I can't choose to do good, what is righteous before God. I've lost that ability. I can only choose to do evil. That's my free will. I'm limited now in my freedom. The Spirit comes and enables you to choose what's right. Believe in Jesus. But apart from the Spirit, I only have one choice. If I say no to the Spirit, my free will only leads me to hell. See, this is one of those So, God judges by his standards, not ours. In Romans 3, may it never be, let God be found true, even though every man be found a liar. We just went through that passage. Genesis, far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall the judge of all the earth deal justly. Who is, who's talking? Abraham. What's the context? Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham is bartering. For those few who are righteous in Sodom, will you spare them? 
And God says, yes, because I'll do what's right. I'll spare the righteous. Okay? Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Job, he's asking a question to his, to his friends. The answer is no. God doesn't do that. God doesn't play games. With God, it's very black and white, right and wrong. The only exception to that is grace. Okay? Black and white, right and wrong. Grace. Grace gets us out of that predicament. Okay? He will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity, fairness. Equity is fairness. fairness. And the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth, he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Okay? And he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Notice all four of those verses say the same thing. God's going to judge the world in righteousness. Right? Every one of them. What does selah mean? It's a, it's a pause in the Hebrew Bible. It's like, take a breath. Let this sink in. Selah. It's like, wow, what did, what did, what did God just say? Take a breath and reflect on it and then move forward. The wow moment. That's the wow moment. Yeah. Okay? All right. God's standard is righteousness. What is righteousness? It's holiness. That's God's standard. That's the standard of judgment. So when you die and go to heaven and stand before God as judge, what's the standard by which you're judged? Righteousness, holiness. Okay? How then do you expect to go to heaven? Because Jesus has taken your unrighteousness, your unholiness away and replaced it with his righteousness and his holiness and faith. You understand that? He has given you what is of him. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we through him might become the righteousness of God. There's your passage, righteousness. We stand before God righteous in Christ. Apart from Christ, we're unholy and unrighteous. In Christ, we're righteous and therefore acceptable to God. Put it this way. If a person could keep the Ten Commandments, all the law of God perfectly, and never sin, could, go, could, they, could they go to heaven? If they could be born without sin and live a perfect life, never sin, would God accept them? Theoretically, yes. Right? When God looks at you in Christ... You've kept his entire law perfectly, completely, and there's no offense against you because Christ kept it perfectly for you and it's a tribute to you. So you have never lied, you've never stolen, you've never cheated, you never lusted, you never did anything wrong, ever. You are an image of Jesus Christ on earth. Because of what he gave you. He gave himself to you. That's how you appear before God. I know you've mentioned this before, but why is it that they say that we are born in sin? We're going to get to that. <laughs> we're getting to that hmm. but if through my lie the truth of God is the truth of God abounded to his glory why am I still being judged as a sinner now Paul is twisting their minds a little bit why is Paul on his way to Rome you remember to confront the execution that is there. To, he's appealed to Caesar. Caesar he's been condemned yes okay He's kind of twisting the thoughts here a little bit, so stick with him. He's been condemned. Why am I being judged as a sinner if you're saying I'm doing wrong and you judge me? But what are we talking about? The very fact that I do wrong demonstrates the righteousness of God. So shouldn't you applaud me? It's a backwards way of thinking. In your mind, in your mind, Jew, who condemned me, the fact that you think I'm blasphemous, you think, the fact that you think I'm a heretic, demonstrates the righteousness of God. Shouldn't you then applaud what I'm doing? That God is being seen as righteous through my error? So he's telling them, you, you guys are worse than I am, but God's righteousness is on me? <laughs> he's, saying, he's saying, if I do wrong, doesn't that demonstrate that God is right? Right. So you're condemning me for doing wrong. Doesn't that demonstrate God is right? Yeah. And yet, so shouldn't you celebrate me instead of kill? <laughs> it's just backwards way of thinking. 
okay? It's, it's, it's rhetoric, it's logic, yeah. okay? If my being a sinner simply demonstrates how true and correct God and correct God and his word are, why am I not rewarded instead of punished? I.e., it's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah. Okay? Romans 9. On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Okay? So, Paul is using a rhetoric device, logic, to, and remember, he's going to Rome. You know, they, he's, he's you know, dealing with the Roman culture and stuff, you know, which, which inherited from the Greeks, the idea of logic and debating and stuff. He, is, he doesn't talk like this when he writes to the Corinthians or the Colossians or Philippians. He is, he is writing using rhetoric and logic as if he is in a debate. So it's a backwards way of logic. If my sin shows the righteousness of God, why am I not rewarded instead of punished when I sin because I'm showing the righteousness of God? Okay? And he goes on. Okay? And why not say as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. So some are reporting that Paul is teaching such things. The more evil we do, the more grace is needed. So do more evil and gain more grace. Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? That's how he put it in his other letters. Because that's one of the things that, that's crept into the church. God's gracious. He gives grace. He dispenses grace and forgiveness when we sin. So the more we sin, the more grace and forgiveness we get. So let's sin a whole bunch and get a whole bunch of grace and forgiveness. Isn't that logical? I mean, that's, that's what they were actually doing. Okay? Romans, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. See, they were, what were the Jews saying? They're blaspheming Paul. What was one of the major accusations against the early church Christians? Do you know? From Paul's point of view? All, all the early church Christians, well, well, throughout the entire first century into the second century, what was one of the major accusations brought against them? That From both Jew and Gentile. Chosen people. No, from both Jew and Gentile. That he, about Paul? No, about all Christians. Oh, about That Jews and Gentiles brought against Christians. They're cannibals. They've got the body of Jesus somewhere, and they're eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Oh. Never heard that, but... Yeah, yeah. that was one of the accusations. And why some people couldn't understand Christianity. How can you eat somebody's flesh? Because, because they understood. When Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, it was his body and blood, not physically, but in a supernatural way. So they taught, we eat the body and blood of Jesus. And people went, oh, they stole his body and they're eating it. They're cannibals. And there were Christians who were persecuted in jail because they were thought to be cannibals. Seriously? Yes. Wow. Yes. You know, they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you. And of course, that was perfect for the Jews. Look at these, look at this her heretical sect. They're cannibals. Let's get rid of them. And they'd stir up the people against them. Okay? Wow, oh, I've never heard it put that way. But it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. For the Jews, that was an accusation they could hang their hat on and get everybody mad at the Christians. So when you, you know, falsely say all kinds of evil against us, okay? That's what they were doing, okay? And condemnation received, the condemnation received by false teachers is deserved, okay? But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give her an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for, for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong, okay? Uh, certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long before and marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I want you to understand something. That passage in Jude gives us a little bit of understanding. And who was Jude? If you don't know, half brother of Jesus. All right. And how can we forget that? Yeah, I'm just just so you know, half brother of Jesus. Uh, a child of Joseph and Mary. 
just like James was, okay? Uh, notice, crept in unnoticed. They've crept in where? To the church. When Paul starts writing back to Corinth and Galatia, and Galatia, the Galatian Christians and Philippi and stuff, there were already people in the church. People had come in who said, God has revealed the truth to me. I know the truth. Don't listen to Paul. Don't listen to Peter. Don't even host them in your home when they come. We have the truth now. We don't need them. And they were leading the people astray. That's why Paul in some of his letters, it just blasts some of those who are leaders in those churches because they are preaching a different gospel, that's what he calls in Galatians, than that which you have received. The leaders had crept, the people had crept in and were leading people astray. Jude's talking about the same thing. Because what do I always tell you? What, what, is, what is Satan attack? The deity of Christ and the, and the gospel. Always attacks those two things, one or the other or both. And the moment the people in Galatia got these false teachers, they were believing, you know, and what was, the, what was the issue? We can go back to the law and live this rigid life and follow all the rules and God's going to be happy with us. We don't need Jesus. And Paul says, you're, you're following a different gospel. Somebody has been preaching you a different gospel, okay? Because if you take away Christ and the cross, you have nothing. Pastor Russ, is it true that they say like someone like you, whose faith is very strong, but you have a lot of knowledge, the devil will attack you harder than he would attack me? I don't know that that's accurate. I think anytime we're serving God, we've got a target on us, okay? Okay. Anytime anyone serves God, there's a bullseye on them from the devil. So it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, some of the people who have no great knowledge, you know, like education and learning kind of thing, but who are serving God in the most faithful way, maybe that's feeding a hungry person or, or ministering to someone who's sick or whatever, will have the biggest bullseye on them because they're doing what God calls us to do. Sitting in an ivory tower teaching a class isn't, it's part of the of God's overall will, but it's not the most important. <laughs> the most important is telling someone about Jesus as their Savior. Yeah. Verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Remember, what was the mindset of the Jews? We are God's chosen people and we're saved because we're Jews. And Gentiles joyfully can go to hell. They didn't care about the Gentiles. Okay? And what's Paul's point? Yeah, I'll agree with you. Gentiles are under the judgment of God. But you know what? So are you. Just because you got Abraham's blood flowing through your veins doesn't not exempt you from the judgment of God or the righteousness he demands. See, Paul is making his case that we're all the same. That's, what, that's where we're at in this, in this epistle, still only in chapter 3. He's making the case that all human beings stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, guilty before God. We all need the same Savior. Okay? Because the mindset was Jews are better, Jews are chosen, and they didn't care about anybody else. Okay? So that's what he's doing. Are the Jews any better off than the Gentiles who rejected God? No. For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. In other words, Jews, you got the law. You know the truth. You know the word. You are given the oracles of God. That's what makes you unique in the world. You haven't been faithful to them. You stand guilty. You stand under the judgment of God. Okay? But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. What scripture is Paul referring to? But the scriptures has shut up everyone under sin. What is he referring to? He didn't have the gospels yet. He didn't have the other epistles. He taught in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the Old Testament was the, the apostles' Bible. They taught the Old Testament. They had this Old Testament scriptures and they preached Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. They didn't have a different word. That was the word they had. And they teach Jesus as the fulfillment. And then as their gospels were written, everything in the church kind of shifted to the New Testament writings, and we kind of forgot the Old Testament. 
But for those first century Christians, the Old Testament was their Bible and the understanding of how Jesus fit into all of it. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Just the previous verses, what was the thing? God's going to judge by his righteous, 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 righteous. That's the standard. Righteousness is the standard. And now we get to Paul saying, there's no one that's righteous. No one. Except Jesus. Okay? There's not a single person, righteous person, in all the world. No one. Well, I heard somebody say there's 7 billion people in the world today. 7 billion. Out of 7 billion, you can't find one? God says no. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who can make the clean out of the unclean? No one. What is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? The answer is there's not any. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked. Who can understand it? For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries. And Jesus said to them, why do you call me good? There is no, there, no one is good except God alone. And you are dead in your trespasses and sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You know, over and over, all these passages have one thing. We're all sinful. So even Jesus said, why do you call me good if I'm not? No, I'm not saying he's not. He's pointing... He's, if you if you see and understand I'm good, understand this. There's no, there's no one that's good except God. So who's that make me? God. Whoa. <laughs> okay. If you call me good and you understand there's no one good except God, then who am I? God. Okay. Douglas, if you want, I can actually print this out. If you want a print out of this. All right. So here's your question, Bobby. I was going to say that. Uh, here's your question. What about infants and small children? Aren't they holy until they actually do something wrong? So typical kind of Baptist theology, age of accountability. We're innocent until we do something wrong. Until we understand. Okay? Without looking at the Bible passages yet, tell me about children. Do children die? Yes. Why do they die? Because the consequences of sin are in this world. If a child was born holy without sin, until they come to the point that they can make a decision to do right and wrong and choose to sin, if they're born holy, a small child would not die because death comes because of sin, because of the corruption of sin. So if a child dies, it proves they're not holy. Because right. if, there's, if there's holiness, there's no death. Okay. When's the last time you had to teach a child to be bad? It comes natural. <laughs> it comes natural. You have to teach them to be, good. to be good. To be obedient. Yeah. Okay. Because the very nature, our human nature, is corrupted by the fall into sin. Not that the child is murdered or done anything. It's just that the corruption is there. We're not talking about actions. We're talking about to the inner core of who someone is. That sin has tainted everything. Okay, uh, now, so the question is, what has God done for children? We're going to get to that, so bring me back to that in a minute. Psalm 51. Uh, what David says in Psalm 51 gives understanding on the doctrine of original sin. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. David's not talking about my mother was committing a sinful act when I was conceived. He was saying the moment I was conceived, I was sinful. Okay. Uh, the wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. Okay? Who can make cl clean out the clean out which you already had? Okay? Uh, the Lord smelled the smoothing aroma, soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I'll never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy Everything, every living thing as I have done. How many people died in the flood? Everybody except for Noah. 
Noah and his eight people. Eight people. Noah, his three sons, and all their wives. Eight people. Okay. And then the animals. Okay. So did children die? Yes. So if God killed children in the flood or children in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were holy, they were sinless, they were innocent, then God is wrong, God is guilty, God is unrighteous, God cannot be, can be God. He cannot bring judgment on someone who is acceptable to him. As hard as we like, don't like that. As hard of a saying as it is, if God brought judgment upon the world and children died, they had to be unholy and unacceptable to God to be under judgment. And again, it's not that they have gone and done anything. It's down to the very core of the, corrupt, the corrupted nature of humanity. All right, so uh, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Come, Bobby, bring me back, back to that passage. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So, uh, what has God done for children? You know, that's one of the, the clashes of theology in the world today. Do children need salvation or not? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and we think it's unfair that God would judge a small child. But in the same way, God has sent Jesus to die for everyone. We, you know, there are those who want to limit it to adults because children don't need it. The typical, let's say Baptist. Let's pick on Baptist, okay? You can do Church of Christ. Hey, you know, we walk, be careful there. I mean, Baptist, Church of Christ, whoever. The typical theology is God's done his part. Now it's up to you to make a decision for God. And at a certain age, they'll prompt you kind of get up, walk the aisle, make your confession, get baptized. And at that point, you become a Christian because up to that point, you were innocent. Okay? But what we're talking about is Scripture reveals that all of us are corrupted by sin and need forgiveness. So if the typical Baptist Church of Christ kind of mindset is, is correct, what happens to a severely mentally handicapped person? What happens to a 30-year-old who's in a bad car wreck and, his, and his, his brain doesn't work anymore and he can't think logically anymore? What, what happens to the, you know, the severely mentally retarded or someone in a coma or whatever? Can they ever be saved if they can't articulate and say, I believe in Jesus as my Savior? No. Matter of the Spirit. I believe what you just said at the beginning of our Sunday school lesson when we get God, the little spirit inside of us, mm -hmm. so that spirit will go meet God. And see, and see, faith mm -hmm. is a matter of God working in the spirit of a person, not the mind of a person. Correct. The mind is about logic and reason. The spirit, what we often refer to as the heart, is not determined by the mind, what I understand. The Holy Spirit comes to create a union with our spirit, not with our mind. So a child at the youngest age, a severely mentally handicapped person, someone who has been has a brain injury or whatever, their spirit is still whole, even if their body isn't working. Correct. And the spirit can bring faith wherever there is a spirit present, that the possibility is there. So we baptize small children. Why? Because God promises that when the water and the word are applied, the spirit is present for what purpose? To create faith, to, to make faith that spirit inside that human being know that God loves them and wants them. It's not dependent upon the mind or reason or intellect or my ability to ascend. What okay? a great way to say that. Okay. That makes sense. So, and, and you think about it. Go back to what Paul says in uh, Colossians when Paul compares circumcision and baptism together. Okay? Give me the, the rubrics for circumcision. It was done to a child when? Eighth day. Eighth day old. Eight days old. Okay? And who was the command given to? To everyone. 
to everyone, but who's supposed to make sure their child's circumcised? Jews. The parents. Yeah, well, the parents. The parents. Yeah. Okay. And he's and and God tells Abraham, you know, if every child born within your within your family, eight days old, every foreigner, slave, whatever you buy, when they come in to be part of your clan, they're circumcised. And what does circumcision mean? You're in the covenant. You're in, you bore the, the circumcision was a sign. You're part of the covenant people of God. But if a child was not circumcised, what happened? Gone. If you do not cut off the foreskin, the person is cut off from being part of the covenant. It was a plan of words, intentional. That's what Moses was told. So it's done to a child by the command given to the parents. And if this is done, God says, you're part of my covenant people. If it's not done, you're not part of my covenant people. Child has no say so. Paul says baptism has taken the place of circumcision. In the New Testament. In the New Testament. In Colossians, he talks about it. That it is baptism that now saves it. So like circumcision, the whole context, then now it's baptism. What is foreshadowed in the old is magnified and made greater in the new. Who could bear the sign in the Old Testament? Only men. Does that mean women weren't part of the covenant in the Old Testament? Well, I wonder that because they all wanted boys, so maybe they some part would think a little well, bit like that. Well, now, now yes, yeah, some would think like that, think, and, yeah. and women were, were definitely in an abused setting with the Jewish mindset. But men and women both were part of the covenant, only the men could bear the sign. Mm -hmm. In the so. New Testament, which is greater, the, you know, what is, the fulfillment is always greater than what foreshadows it, both men and women bear the sign. You are baptized. And what happens in baptism? God puts his name upon you and you bear the name. You bear the sign. Okay? His name is the sign. Go to Revelation. You know, uh, Revelation it shows Satan seeking to claim his people and mark them with his name. The number 666, which is an imperfect number. Three of them because he's trying to be God. Trinity. But six is a number that means nothing in the Bible. It's an imperfect number. So he puts 666 on it, and the word used is for a brand or a scar. Like he took this hot iron and he branded something. It's ugly and hideous compared to what God does when he puts his name upon us and seals us like an embossed seal or something valuable and precious. We bear the name of God as his children. Satan tries to mimic and do what God does, and it always falls short. So it's done to a child by God's command given to the parents, to the church, do this and the child is part of the covenant. God comes to bless. What is God's goal? To work faith, to bless, to adopt, to, to love. God's not looking for a way to send us to hell. He's got that. He's looking for every opportunity to save, to claim us as his own. That's what his heart is about. Any thoughts? I'm still in the wild moments. <laughs> we got to stop here because our time is out. Anything else? Well, let's pray and I'll end the, end the tape. Father God, we ask you to bless us as we leave this place and move next door for worship. May you be present among us and may we learn more deeply, more intimately, intimately all that you desire of us as your people. Let us celebrate your blessings and your gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I will stop. Are you going to mention?